Bye, everybody. Hello, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. Well, at least here in Northern California, it's a soggy morning, which is actually a good thing. Yes, nice. And Brazil, that's just uh, 2 p.m. afternoon. Oh, very good. Where, whereabouts are you located? Uh, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Oh, my. South Brazil. Okay. Yes, wow. <laughs> I would like to visit down that way sometime. Yeah, hello. You'll be very welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. Hello, Christian. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for making time to meet today. We're just waiting My till pleasure. we uh, gather quorum here. Mehdi should be joining us, who's the uh, chair of the work group. Okay. They let me help out. Muriel, I'm glad to see that uh, you were able to uh, make it or I uh, got the updated invitation. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Matthias. How are you doing? Everything good. Uh, how about you? Good, good. Thank you. All right. We're just waiting for uh, Medic to join us here. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> hey, Christian. Hi, Medi. How are you doing? Uh, good. How are you? Good. Thanks. Well, do you guys start doing some testing? More testing, I guess. We're, we actually ordered the probe card. And yeah, hopefully we can. Uh, we have one student that can help us uh, doing additional measurement before we actually get the probe card. Yeah, cool. that's the. We're actually, we're, we're thinking about measuring noise act on, the, uh, on those devices. We'll try to do that. Not sure it's doable, but we'll try. That would be amazing. We have a, a, a board that uh, we use to do something else. And uh, we think that we probably could use it with the uh, test structure and eventually help us, you know, getting to extract the noise. Didn't you need some specific structures for for noise? Uh... Um, ideally, uh, uh, ideally, what would be the the best would be to design dedicated test structure, uh, yeah. which we have done uh, for twenty two FDSOI. Unfortunately, the the chip uh, somehow we we the test structure works, but all the additional circuitry, uh, you know, that doesn't work the way we. We saw it, but for Skywater, it would be nice to, you know, design a, a, mm -hmm. such a, a test structure. Yeah. So just for background, um, Chris, uh, Professor Christian, uh, student has made a PR with some measurements, um, and I, I put the pull request here. So this is just initial results, and they look much better than the previous ones. So um, and Christian today is going to work on uh, or present his. Uh, his work on EKV modeling and um, maybe some of these measurements, hopefully. Uh, so thanks so much, Christian, for yeah. agreeing to do this. And I hope everyone would have some questions. All right, thank you, Mehdi. Well, actually, I'm not going to show uh, I'm not going to show measurements we we made recently on Skywater. I I wait. We have a bit more of that, and uh, we may then make a, a dedicated uh, presentation just on That's these right. measurements. Yeah. I'll show you actually measurements done on much more advanced technologies. So let me know when I should start actually. So 
Sure. Uh, I think we can start. Uh, what do you think, Rob? Uh, yes, I think we have quorum. So yeah, appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So then let me share my screen. All right, there we go. Do, do you see my slides? Yep. Yeah. All right. So, yes. So in, in this presentation, uh, I would like to show you how we can use our uh, AKV model and its uh, simplified version we call simplified AKV model to do a systematic design of low power analog and eventually also RFC MOS circuits. The, this uh, work actually is the result of a long uh, work we've been doing uh, on EKV. And, uh, but uh, the most recent work has been done together with my PhD student, Hang Chi Han, who is also attending. So if you have specific question on the extractor, he will be able to answer. All right, so I'll go through a short introduction. I'll then present you our simplified EKV MOSFET model just in a nutshell. And then I'll show you some figures of merit that are very well described by uh, our simplified EKV model and can be used then as design guidelines for uh, designing analog circuits. Then uh, at the end of the talk, uh, I'll have just a, a few slides uh, about talking how can we make this model available to the z designer, what's the current status of this and what do we plan to do uh, uh, further to to improve and 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 uh, um, deploy the this model. And finally, I'm going to conclude. Let me start here with some data on uh, uh, voltage supply. Uh, on the left, you see how uh, the supply and the threshold voltage have been scaled over the years and over technology nodes. And clearly, we see here that we have entered the uh, uh, subvolt area uh, a few already a few years back, and that we are basically heading towards uh, a 0.5 volt supply. So this is probably uh, a good news, or mostly driven by digital, but uh, it's a nightmare for analog. We all know that, but basically, we have to to work with this uh, low voltage. Now, what's the impact of low voltage on, on analog uh, circuits and particularly uh, on, on devices? Well, basically, if we look at this characteristic here, which shows you the drain current, it's the normalized drain current, which we'll call the inversion coefficient. I'll come back to the definition of this just in a second, versus the overdrive voltage. This has been measured on a 28 nanometer bulk CMOS technology. So on a minimum length device, so we clearly see here a, a linear behavior because of velocity saturation. So clearly what we see here is that indeed uh, strong inversion spans over a quite wide range of voltage. So typically here, roughly 0 0.5, 0 0.6 volts. But uh, however, because of voltage scaling, actually the operating point is moving from strong inversion into this region of moderate inversion here. Actually, as someone uh, said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So let's, let's uh, represent that same curve here in the log scale. And then we discover that the IV characteristic of this uh, 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 NMOS channel and channel MOS transistor is actually uh, much wider. It spans over uh, six, almost six decades of current. And we, even though strong inversion, which is this uh, uh, purple region here, uh, uh, spans over a wide range of voltage, it not even covers uh, a one decade of current. Uh, we see that most of the current, uh, most of the IV region here is uh, uh, covered by moderate region and weak inversion representing six decades of current. So clearly, uh, uh, in advanced technologies under uh, low voltage operation, we're leaving this region of strong inversion, moving into this region of moderate inversion, where the characteristic is neither quadratic, neither linear, neither exponential. And you will see that a bit later that in this region of moderate inversion, uh, it's kind of a sweet spot for many uh, uh, analog circuit optimization. 
Uh, another thing uh, which is uh, which we see here is that the traditional overdrive voltage is not really very convenient when we move down to moderate and eventually weak inversion. It actually gets close to zero or eventually negative. And this is the reason why we're actually switching from overdrive voltage to inversion coefficient. I'll come to that just in a second. Um, this plot shows you again the IV characteristics, so normalized current, inversion coefficient as a function of the gate resistance, assuming that we're now having a 0.5 volt supply. So let's say our VDD is now 0.5 volt, and we have a, uh, a threshold voltage, say, of 200 millivolts. Uh, if we look at a, a typical bulk CMOS device with a, a typical uh, slope factor of 1.5, which is typical for bulk, 200 millivolt threshold voltage. What we see here is that we, at, at this uh, uh, 0.5 volt uh, uh, VG, we don't even reach strong inversion anymore. We could say, well, let's move then for uh, FDSOI. So uh, FDSOI should have a steeper slope, ideally of one that's only valid actually for long channel transistor. Uh, this improved, so with the same threshold voltage, this slightly improves things, but we barely enter into strong inversion, as you can see here with this blue curve. The only way to get into weak, uh, into strong inversion is actually to scale the uh, threshold voltage and to lower it, for example, here you lower it to 150 uh, 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 millivolts and keeping a slope factor of one, we can now enter a little bit into strong inversion. So my message here is basically for advanced technologies in low voltage, uh, strong inversion will simply disappear. It is then important to have a model that captures actually the behavior of the uh, transistor right in this moderate inversion region. And uh, as you will see uh, next, our simple uh, simplified EKV uh, model does a good job actually in this region. So let me now introduce the uh, simplified EKV model. I don't want to spend too much time on the uh, equations and uh, on the physics of the device, but I need to introduce the inversion coefficient IC, which I talked already several times. So as mentioned, overdrive voltage, not really very convenient for weak inversion. We prefer to use this inversion coefficient, which uh, characterizes basically the level of inversion of a transistor that is biased in saturation and is simply defined as the ratio of the drain current in saturation to the specific current. Now, what, what is the specific current? The specific current is actually uh, the current that is specific to the uh, technology with the specific current per square, which depends on these technology parameter, the mobility, the slope factor, the oxide capacitance per unit area, and UT, which is KT over Q. This is a fundamental parameter for the designer. It's uh, uh, specific to technology and specific to each type of transistor. And then the specific current is also specific to the uh, geometry of the, of the transistor, so the W over L. Uh, typical values of this uh, specific current per square, this is for 28 nanometer uh, transistors or technology, typically 750 nanoamps for NMOS and about 200 nanoamps for PMOS. It increases as we scale down the technology simply because uh, uh, mobility, but mostly CX is actually increasing. Using IC, we can then easily define uh, three different regions of operation. We are or remain in strong inversion if IC is larger than 10, which becomes more and more difficult to achieve in at low voltage and in advanced technologies. Moderate, and, and here uh, the current is mostly a drift current. Uh, then moderate inversion spans from 0.1 to 10. In this region, it's a mix between diffusion and drift. That's why it's neither exponential, neither quadratic. And then uh, below 0.1, uh, the, we have weak inversion where the current is mostly a diffusion current and where we have the exponential characteristic. We can also define subthreshold as the region for which IC is simply smaller than one. 
So just remember about this def definition of IC, we'll use it uh, quite often in this presentation. All right, so those are, the, the EKV model is, is a charge-based model and uh, it actually is built with two uh, coupled equation. The first one is expressing the normalized uh, drain current in saturation as a function of QS. And what is QS? QS is simply the charge, the inversion charge at the source side of the channel, normalized by uh, two times N times C ox UT, we call it the specific charge, uh, which is taken negative so that QS is positive for an NMOS transistor. And then we see this additional parameter lambda C, which plays a very important role for short channel devices. It's called the velocity saturation parameter. It basically corresponds to the fraction of the channel under which uh, we have full velocity saturation. It basically scales like one over the length of the channel, where LSAT is the channel length over which we have, uh, where the carriers are under uh, full velocity saturation. Uh, the second coupled equation re uh, re relies the uh, voltage, the saturation voltage VP minus VS to the uh, 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 normalized charge QS. And the two combined together uh, gives you the simplified DKV where you can express then the voltage as a function of the current. Uh, by the way, all the voltages here are all normalized to the uh, KT over Q, and VP is actually the pinch off voltage, uh, overdrive voltage divided by N. It's the voltage at which the transistor enters into forward saturation for a long channel device. So what we see here is that we, uh, with SEKV, we basically just need four parameters the threshold voltage, the specific current per square, the slope factor, mostly describing uh, the uh, behavior in weak inversion, and the saturation length or the lambda C parameter. Now, unfortunately, we cannot invert this equation and express the current as a function of the voltage, but actually we don't need that because you will see that after uh, most of the uh, parameter for the designers are small signal parameters, such as the transconductance, uh, uh, as you see, and the large signal part, uh, we can then uh, use a, a MATLAB or another a tool to, to, to draw that. I'll show you some measurements results. Those are fairly recent resu results that Hang Chi has measured on advanced processes and compares actually bulk FDSOI, it's a 28 nanometer bulk and 22 nanometer FDSOI and a 16 nanometer FinFET. On the left, you have results for NMOS, on the right, PMOS. Uh, the circles are uh, bulk, triangle FDSOI and the uh, square FinFET with the IC in log scale as a function of the overdrive voltage corresponding to these curves here, and in a linear scale corresponding to these curves here. So the first thing we see here is that thanks to the normalization, uh, which is really a key aspect of the development of EKV, we see that uh, this normalization process actually strips off all the technology or most of the technology dependence uh, and for that reason, all these curves coming from very different technologies, once the parameters have been extracted and the current and voltage have been normalized, uh, they fall almost on top of each other. We see some slight discrepancies in weak inversion. This is simply because they don't have the same slope factor. And uh, we see some discrepancy in strong inversion. This is simply because they don't have the same lambda C or, or LSAT parameter. But in both cases, NMOS and PMOS, you see that basically they're all falling very close to each other. Additionally, uh, you see that this simple model with just four parameters can do a really good job over almost five decades of current for both NMOS and PMOS. 
Uh, we also did measurements uh, to include the effect of the back gate, and this is shown here again for NMOS on the left and PMOS on the right. Uh, IV characteristic in log scale and uh, in linear scale for different uh, values of the back gate voltage going from positive to negative values. And you see that uh, uh, we can catch all of these measurements. Of course, for each of these curves, the threshold voltage is changed according to the back gate voltage. Same thing for the PMOS device, as you can see here. This is obviously uh, interesting for FDSOI, and we can then really use this to design circuit and adjust uh, where we can adjust the threshold voltage, which is a key feature of FDSOI. All right, so uh, now let's move to the small signal uh, uh, model and just uh, recalling that the transconductance is really the most important parameter for analog, but also for RF IC design. Um, because the transconductance is actually proportional to the charge in a charge-based model, it's pretty straightforward to express the transconductance in terms of the charge. It's actually proportional. The normalize, what we call the normalized source charge, which is the gate trans, uh, source transconductance, which is the gate transconductance GM, divided by NUT uh, I spec, is uh, simply equal to the normalized charge QS we have seen. And it depends only on the inversion coefficient with a single parameter, which is the lambda C parameter, which allows to capture for the effect of velocity saturation appearing in short channel devices. In weak inversion, we don't have any velocity saturation and this transconductance increases with the current and therefore proportionally to IC. But in strong inversion under velocity saturation, the transconductance doesn't increase anymore. It saturates, it saturates to this value one over lambda C. So lambda C is an interesting parameter because, or one over lambda C uh, is an interesting uh, parameter because it gives the maximum transconductance that you can get for a short channel device that is in velocity saturation uh, for a given technology. Just some measurements of the transconductance. Uh, those are measurements uh, for a 28 nanometer 228 nanometer bulk technology in red and blue from different foundries and one uh, 40 nanometer in green. And you clearly see here in a log log scale, the normalized transconductance versus the inversion coefficient, the region of weak inversion where all the points fall on top of each other. Uh, again, showing the, the strengths of the normalization and then saturating to this value one over lambda C where lambda C is slightly different for each of these technology. So this is not good news actually that the transconductance saturates at high IC because uh, you can put more current, you simply will, uh, uh, will not get more uh, transconductance. We have measured this uh, uh, GM also uh, on bulk FDSOI and FinFET on the same devices as shown earlier. And uh, on, on the left NMOS, on the uh, uh, right PMOS, comparing this, we see again that the, all the, the points, I, I think someone has the mic open. Can everyone mute, please? All right. Can, can, can folks mute, please? Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, again, here you see all points fall on top of each other, and we have a very good fit with a very simple expression, only depending on IC and the parameter lambda C, and that's both for NMOS and uh, PMOS transistor for all of this of these advanced technologies. All right, so let me move on and I'll show you here uh, several figures of merit and uh, try to explain how they can be used to guide the designer optimizing his operating point for analog and RF circuits. We 
basically have three main figures of merit. The most important one is the well-known GM over ID, which uh, states how much transconductance you get for a given current. So it's a fundamental figure of merit for low power design. Uh, the FT, the transit frequency, which also depends on the transconductance, which basically evaluates the maximum frequency above which we have no more uh, gain, uh, also affects very much the uh, noise figure, as we'll see in a second. And then we have the product of the two, the GM over ID times FT, which is a, a figure of merit that has been used recently uh, for the design of RF, uh, LNA, uh, uh, low noise amplifier circuit design. Let's start with the GM over I. Again, this represents the normalized gate transconductance as a function of the inversion coefficient. By definition, it is equal to one in weak inversion, so in this region, and then for a long transistor, it basically scales like one over the square root of the current, or if you want one over the square root of the inversion coefficient. That's for a long channel without velocity saturation. As soon as we include velocity saturation, then uh, it doesn't change anything in weak inversion because we have low field and we don't have velocity saturation in weak inversion but clearly it impacts the strong inversion region where finally the GM over I uh, scales like one over IC or actually one over lambda C times IC. So what this tells you is that for a given IC, for a short channel a transistor, you get less transconductance for the same current budget. So this is, this is not good news. It means that if you want to get the same transconductance, you'll need to put more current in there to get uh, the desired transconductance. Interesting is that slope here is actually crossing the unity line here for an inversion coefficient that is actually equal to one over lambda C. And this is the way actually we extract this parameter lambda C from measurements. I'll show you here some measurements. First, uh, again, comparing uh, bulk FDSOI and FinFET. On the top, we have NMOS. On the bottom, PMOS. And again, if you do the normalization correctly after having extracted all the uh, uh, parameters, you again see here that we have a very good fit. The, and they almost fall on top of, of each other for NMOS and PMOS. I think this is quite remarkable. I, I, this GM over I characteristic, the normalized one is really, really universal, uh, independent, almost independent of technology, independent of uh, uh, type of transistor. And you will see later uh, that it's even independent of temperature. Uh, it's even independent of the backgate voltage. This shows you here uh, the GM over I characteristic versus IC. Uh, for NMOS and PMOS, uh, sh long channel devices are here. Short channel devices show this velocity saturation. And even if you change the backgate voltage, all the points fall on top of each other after proper normalization, of course. And this is true for NMOS and PMOS, as you can see here. As I say, uh, the GM over I characteristic is quite remarkable because uh, this shows actually the same normalized uh, GM over I measured on 28 nanometer bulk on the left and uh, uh, 28 nanometer FDO so I on the right. In red, it's uh, measurements made at room temperature and in blue, the measurements have been done at liquid helium at 4.2 K. You see that there's very little change actually, whether it's for uh, NMOS, uh, for bulk or FDSOI. The only difference is that we see a little bit more uh, uh, transconductance uh, in uh, strong inversion. This is just because the velocity saturation depends on temperature and actually we have a bit less velocity saturation under low temperature. But except of that, for a long channel transistor, this shows you a short channel transistor, but for a long channel transistor, you wouldn't even see uh, any difference between room temperature and cryo temperature. So 
gem override quite a universal uh, characteristic. Some more measurements uh, at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, on the left, you have the large signal IV characteristic. Those are made on a PMOS device from a 28 nanometer transistor. These are large transistors. And you see again that uh, the model can capture the, uh, the behavior uh, from room temperature down to uh, cryo temperature. So the room temperature has obviously the uh, uh, this slope and the slope increases as we go down to shorter uh, to lower temperature. On the right is uh, again the GM over I, but here measured on a 28, uh, 22 nanometer FDSO I at uh, five different temperature from room temperature down to uh, 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 three uh, Kelvin. We see some slight deviation here, but except of that, there's not much changes. Uh, some very recent measurements that are not published yet, they, they, uh, they will be hopefully presented at uh, next ISCAS. Uh, those have been measured on 16 nanometer fin fat, PMOS uh, on long channel PMOS, as you can see here, at three different temperatures. We see some noise here because it's quite difficult to extract the, the slope here on those uh, IV characteristic. And uh, this is for a, a short PMOS, where again, you see uh, uh, the GM over I uh, and all the points that fall on top of each other. We have some deviation here simply because the uh, uh, lambda C is a bit different. This is 16 nanometer length, so quite uh, advanced uh, process. Let me move now to uh, RF uh, and uh, look at FT. Uh, this plot shows you FT as a function of the inversion coefficient. Remember that FT is G just GM over C. Uh, the gate capacitance and the gate capacitance doesn't change that much with the uh, inversion coefficient. So it's basically what we see here is the behavior of the uh, transconductance. Now, if we introduce the definition of uh, specific trans, uh, transit frequency, which is simply defined as the extrapolation from weak inversion, the, the, the transit frequency you would get if you could extrapolate weak inversion at an inversion coefficient of one. In this particular 40 nanometer process, it corresponds to 128 gigahertz. Then uh, you can show easily that the peak transit frequency is simply equal to this FT spec uh, divided by lambda C. So if you know lambda C from the GM over I characteristic, you extract FT spec, you know how much you can get out of a technology in terms of peak FT. In this 40 nanometer technology, it's about 263 uh, uh, gigahertz. Uh, we also have measured this for a 28 nanometer bulk process. And of course the FT spec is now higher thanks to scaling, 227 gigahertz. And the peak FT is now actually not much higher simply because the lambda C or the one over lambda C is smaller. So we only get 50% more uh, FT when moving from the FT spec to uh, strong inversion. All right, finally, we can combine the GM over I and the FT, uh, building up a figure of merit. Yeah, yeah that basically tells you uh, uh, that is the ratio of the gain bandwidth to the uh, uh, added thermal noise. Hey, Vlad, could... I think you're mute, please. Uh, Rob, I think you can mute him if you want. If you want. Oh, like can. So, cool. All right. Let me see if I can. Just give me a second. Hey, can I ask you to mute your mic, please? 
No, ale ja chcę kupić, ale... Excuse me, can, can I help you to mute your mic, please? Time. All right. So this... Uh, hey, Vlad. Ale nie jest wykluczone, że może trzeba czekać więcej niż miesiąc. All right. So ale what do we do? Ale cena jest ta sama, jest taka płata, jak w Polsce. I'm trying to see if I can do this. You can mute him, just click on him on the three points. Three dots at the top and you can mute him. Oh my goodness. All right. Vladek, can you please mute? There's another meeting going on here. <laughs> so, do we stop here or? <laughs> um, all right, I'll stop here. Uh, Vladek, could you mute your mic, please? Nieco? Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Okay, let me restart here. All right. So I was just uh, introducing this uh, GM over I times uh, 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 FT figure of merit that basically is used to maximize the gain bandwidth product, minimize the noise at the given current. And this has been used to optimize LNAs and find uh, the optimum inversion coefficient. Why is there an optimum where basically this shows this GM over I times uh, FT, a uh, normalized uh, figure of merit versus IC measured. You, you need to share your slides, sorry. Oh, excuse me. Okay, you see Perfect. them? All yeah. right, all right, sorry for that. So I was just uh, uh, showing here the uh, no, this GM over I times FT normalized figure of merit as a function of IC, which shows actually a maximum a middle, uh, no, in the upper side of moderate inversion. Why does it have maximum? Because in weak inversion, we don't have velocity saturation. And uh, the, uh, this figure of merit is just increasing well, proportionally to IC. But at some point, the GM actually saturates. And because of that, uh, this GM over I times FT decreases. And we see here that the maximum, the good news is that the maximum is in this region of moderate inversion. That's for a 40 nanometer process. For the 28 nanometer, it's actually even uh, lower at the lower inversion coefficient, almost in the middle of the moderate inversion region. Uh, we can combine actually those three figures of merit on top the GM over I, maximum in weak inversion and then decreasing in strong inversion, FT, which is exactly the opposite, uh, which increases in uh, weak inversion and then saturates into uh, when we reach strong inversion. And of course, the product which shows actually this maximum uh, in moderate inversion. And again, here you see the model is extremely simple and fits extremely well the measurements shown uh, by the red dots here. That's uh, 40 nanometer on, on the left and 28 nanometer on the, on the right. And again, uh, we were able to capture this behavior with just a single parameter, which is this lambda C parameter. Um, in uh, analog, but also in RF and probably even more in RF, one important additional figure of merit is the thermal noise excess factor, which is equal to the input referred 
noise, thermal noise resistance that you have at the gate of your transistor multiplied by its gate transconductance. This gamma normally is very close to one for a long channel device, but for short channel, it starts to increase. And we have recently presented just a few weeks back a simple model that shows that this gamma is actually increasing linearly with the inversion coefficient. This has been validated here on all these uh, five different technologies. Uh, and we see that as we move to a lower technology node, it gets steeper and uh, gamma typically reaches several, uh, I mean, up to three to four might say one or three doesn't matter that much. Actually, it's not true because if you want to uh, get back your initial noise, uh, noise, you just have to increase your, uh, you need to increase your transconductance by a factor three. If you're in weak inversion, this needs three times more current. So it has a direct impact on power consumption. Interesting is that the slope of this characteristic here is actually scaling like, one over L. Now, using that model, we can now uh, catch the minimum of the ratio of gamma divided by GM. This is the input referred noise, thermal noise resistance. And uh, it is actually, uh, it scales like one over IC in weak inversion and increases actually like IC because of velocity saturation and because of the fact that gamma increases and GM uh, uh, is saturating to a uh, maximum value. So in between here, you again find the minimum of this input referred noise resistance that again sits right in the middle of, on the upper side of the moderate inversion region, about 1.5 here. No, sorry, about six. Uh, IC optimum is about six. This allows you actually to model uh, uh, the L an LNA and optimize its input referred noise resistance, uh, which is roughly equal to the gate resistance, which becomes important at RF, and the input referred thermal noise resistance, which when you plot it versus IC, shows this uh, behavior with this maximum around uh, uh, an inversion coefficient of 10. And you see that our super simple model is able to catch these measurements that uh, were measured on a 40 nanometer technology at two uh, frequency 10 and 14 gigahertz. On the right, you have the uh, minimum noise figure. Uh, I will not go into detail, but it also depends on this gamma over GM parameter and therefore also shows a minimum right at the same level here. And again, with a very simple model, you can have a reasonably good fit of this uh, uh, minimum uh, noise uh, factor or, or noise figure. All right, um, there are many additional uh, uh, figure of merits that can be used. We didn't talk at all about linearity, but uh, in a recent paper, uh, we have shown that we can also express the linearity of a, uh, of a transistor in terms of the inversion coefficient. And this translates, for example, in expressing the input referred, uh, no, sorry, the uh, um, intermodulation, second order intermodulation product IP2 as a function of IC. Again, here you see the, the simple model compared to measurements and probably even more important, the uh, uh, intermodulation product, the third order intermodulation input referred intermodulation product IP3 as a function of IC. Interesting to see here that the, we have a sweet spot here where the uh, uh, we have some cancellation appearing that is again right in the middle of moderate inversion. All right, I'll stop here, and uh, I still have uh, one or two slides, uh, and may just want to open the discussion on how can we make this uh, uh, simplified EKV available to the designer community. Actually, we uh, uh, Hang Chi uh, started to do some work uh, in that direction uh, already. Uh, he developed a tool uh, in Python 
that can automatically extract the parameters, those four parameters I mentioned. Um, this works very nice. It's uh, automatic. You can use either measurements if you have them. If you don't have measurements, you can generate the data from your PDK and then extract those parameters. The tool is now available on GitLab. You can download it, install it, and run it uh, on your own. Um, uh, I'll show some slides and maybe Hang Chi can say a few words about that. Uh, we're also working on uh, some Jupyter notebooks to uh, capture the design methodology on simple analog circuits. Uh, we have done some simple design uh, of OTA that were actually validated for a 22 nanometer FDSOI process. Here, it's probably important that I uh, stress the fact that the simplified EKV model is not a compact model. We're not trying to substitute the compact model that is available in your PDK. We're just, you should use it as a fancy calculator, helping you to size your devices and find the optimum bias point. And then you can, after having done the extraction, you can then run your simulation and you will see that you're getting very close to uh, if you're if you have done the extraction correctly, you're you're going to be very close to what is predicted by the model. As a next step, and this uh, should be discussed, but uh, it would be nice actually to customize those uh, uh, notebooks for the Skywater 130 nanometer uh, process. Eventually, uh, close the loop by designing uh, those uh, simple building blocks and then measuring them, and therefore. Uh, validating the, the methodology. So here is a, a slide. I don't know if Hang Chi is still uh, online. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Hang Chi, you want to comment that slide that was recently presented a few weeks back at the uh, EasyCast conference where Hang Chi presented the tool he developed. We don't really have time to go into all the details, but maybe you can just give the 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 main points here. Okay, so uh, the, the tool is available on the GitLab and also you can download or install on your uh, on your laptop or PC uh, because it's a Python based extractor so you can just pre-install as EKVE and you can, go, you can get it on your local machine. And this slide presents the extraction flow for the simplified EKV model so it's basically separate into two parts. We have the extraction for the IDVG. I will not go for the detail because there are many things there. And another part is extraction for the IDVD. So if we get the a set of, uh, I mean, the, the single transfer characteristic IDVG at saturation VDS, we can get four parameters. And then if you give IDVD, a set of IDVD from weak inversion to strong inversion, then we can get another two parameters describing the output conductance. So in total, we have six parameters that can be uh, be used and to optimize your circuit. Yep. That's all. Okay. And um, let me see here. Uh, this is typically the results you get out of the extraction and the flow, starting with the uh, ID over GM, then the GM over ID, and then it goes through several several steps. And here you see the output conductance, which is also an important parameter. I didn't talk too much about that because we still are working on that, but you see we can get even a good fit of the output conductance and therefore of the self-gain of a transistor. So, um, all right, and here are the parameters that uh, correspond to the, the plots I showed you earlier, the four parameters you, that, uh, that we have extracted that correspond to these uh, measurements on uh, bulk, fin fat, and FDSOI. All right, so let me conclude here. Well, I showed you that because of the reduction of supply voltage, the operating points are moving from strong inversion into the subthreshold region, so moderate and weak inversion, and under very low voltage, uh, strong inversion will simply completely disappear. Uh, 
I've shown you that the uh, simplified EKV model can still do a very good job, even if we're for very advanced technologies with only four parameters. And again, it's not a compact model. It's uh, more a model that helps designer to uh, start their initial design. And then the validation is still done with the um, compact model available in, in the PDK. I showed you that we can express uh, many figures of merit and, and, and device parameters in terms of the inversion coefficient, such as the GM over I, which only then depends on IC and on with a single parameter, which is the velocity uh, saturation parameter lambda C. We can then optimize uh, analog and RF circuits and find the uh, uh, optimum operating point. We have seen also that it seems that moderate inversion turns out to be a sweet spot uh, offering a good trade-off for many of these figures of merit and particularly for low power design. And as we discussed, we already started to uh, deploy the, uh, the, the, the extraction tool and make it available to the designer community. Hopefully we can continue this work and, and uh, then uh, show how to use this model, uh, uh, presenting different examples of, uh, of uh, design of sim simple building blocks. All right, so I'll stop here. And uh, I don't know if there are some questions, all right, thanks so much, Christian. That, that was really uh, insightful and exciting. So I think we have about 10 minutes, so I will open up to questions. Feel free to ask your question. So just for clarification, if I may ask a question. So you would supply this model alongside the PDK to designers for the sole purpose of um, doing some hand calculations, like you showed, simple calculations. Yes, yes. Uh, you, we use it as a, well, hand calculation is, yeah. I mean, I mean you maybe still- Maybe let's say Python calculation. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think you still need a MATLAB or Python tool, but yes, indeed. And so that just helps you uh, 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 designing simple analog uh, building blocks, and then you validate them uh, in your uh, in your PDK. And is the model available as a Verilog A? Uh, I mean, it's so simple. So maybe we could just implement yeah, it anyhow. I mean, but... so if you want to have it as a Verilog A, it means you want to use it as a compact model, right, in your simulator. So we are working on that uh, to still have, you know. Uh, to, to be able to do some validation with, with the SEKV as a compact model. Of course, you know, for compact model, the, 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 the difficult part is always the output characteristic and the output conductance. So we're not there yet, but yeah, the model is so simple is that uh, at least all the transfer characteristic is already available in very low gain. Now you can use another uh, uh, flavor of EKV, either the uh, EKV 3.0 developed by Matthias Büscher, uh, who I think uh, uh, is online, or an even older model, this is what I use for my lectures, for example, uh, an EKV 2.6, which is also available in many uh, uh, simulator. So, uh, and the models then are, are very similar but the parameters are not exactly the same and it requires a bit more parameter. Um, EK, sure. EKV 2.6 is maybe roughly 10 to 12 parameters. And one more question. Um, if we would use these models in the open source community, like the full EKV models, is the license even allowing this? Or is it like a CMC license? What, what, is, what is it? Well, uh, the EKV 2.6 should be in the public domain. Although I think there's some confusion about, you know, making 2.6 available. For EKV 3, I don't know, maybe I'll let uh, Matthias answer that question. Uh, you're, you're right, exactly, uh, Christian. Uh, EKV 2.6 uh, should, be, should be fully uh, uh, open source, uh, and uh, actually we are planning to do the same with EKV3, 
uh, over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, I think I think it's time to to make it uh, very widely available and uh, hopefully to to reach uh, a wider uh, community. And uh, uh, okay, just just uh, since I'm I'm talking. Uh, uh, anyone interested in, in, in uh, getting access to, to EKV3 in terms of open source, uh, please be in contact. Uh, it, it will be great to, to be there. <clears throat> uh, Christian, great, uh, great material. Um, I think it's a, it's a good idea, Matthias. I think it's a good idea to make uh, EKV3 available as a public domain model. Okay, uh, sure. I, I, I think I think uh, the connection with with the model that that you're presenting in terms of uh, uh, let's say uh, helping designers to to do their job is, is is really one of the of the big strengths. Uh, and uh, also, I think uh, your your model uh, approach, uh, including the velocity saturation. Uh, has been extremely helpful also to to uh, education. Actually, I, I think it's it's really a great tool, and I congratulate you on that. Um, Thank you. Uh, just just a, a, a short um, question on on the uh, on the noise. Um, it's a gamma factor uh, of uh, on noise. You, you've you've presented uh, actually a, a linear. Uh, relationship of gamma yeah. factor with with respect to to uh, to IC mm -hmm. is uh, and and then it's it's a one over L um, dependence on on channel length is that is is that that's, that's, what that's correct about? and uh, and again this is a very simple and simplified model we know that the physics behind is is not just velocity saturation there are many more effects that impact the gamma factor but here we just wanted to have a simple uh uh you know a, a little bit empirical model but that works very well and scales reasonably well uh that's that's really an interesting uh, uh effect as well Okay, uh, thanks uh, from my side. Uh, great so, work. So is there any other questions? Um, if you're familiar with uh, BSIM bulk, actually the heart of BSIM bulk is nothing else than EKV, the charge-based model. It's a merge actually between uh, BSIM4 uh, and uh, EKV. So the long channel model in BSIM bulk is very close actually to uh, EKV and uh, where they added all the short channel effects coming from BSIM4. So that would be yet another option. So one other thing I wanted to bring up here in the meeting is um, there's a there's a bunch of work being done to improve the models in Skywater 130, and I think Rob and uh, Boris have been talking to Skywater. So I don't know if Rob or Boris want to give an update on that. We did chat with them, uh, and uh, Steve did acknowledge that when the models were created uh, for Sky 130, that the voltage ranges that the models were characterized for uh, were not, you know, consistent with design technology or design style, I should say better, uh, in today's, uh, you know, products that are being requested or developed. And so uh, trying to set up a follow-up meeting uh, with the uh, semi mod in particular about trying to see if we can do any work in terms of modeling but Boris you probably can give much better technical detail than I can no I mean I think that captures it pretty well I mean essentially the the current model in particular for the PMOS uh, falls apart in moderate inversion and this is very undesired because we know it's actually a sweet spot for analog design so until this gets fixed, it's it's a bit scary to design in this technology. Anything that's a little more advanced than you know, just randomly putting a couple hundred millivolts gate overdrive on the on the transistor, which is really not a good design point. Yeah, so I think um, Christian has been testing, or um, I mean, he's been funded to do some of the measurements uh, on the test structures and hopefully the open source ones. And I think his measurements looks much better than uh, the previous ones. So uh, hopefully we can get some work done on modeling. Um, 
other invariant A or EKV. Uh, but you know, uh, I think this is great, and uh, Sumimod can or Marcus here can pitch in to give their update on that as well. So what uh, we plan to I do agree. is, uh, as soon as we get the probe card, we'll be able to do many more measurements, mm -hmm. uh, starting with single device measurements, and type P type, and uh, and then, you know, constitute a, a database that uh, should be made then available. And the next step would then be to uh, improve the models, so maybe redo the extraction and improving the models uh, for that technology. Well, and I, I would propose that we use uh, EKV 2.6 then, if, if that would be We option. can try, we can try to do that and uh, see what we get. Um, for 130 nanometer, I think there shouldn't be too much problem. Uh, if we go to more advanced technologies, uh, and it depends very much how, how we want to do that. So if you want to have a scalable model, uh, then it would be difficult. But uh, uh, now today, even, you know, BSIM4 is 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 anyway binned. Uh, so uh, I, I think we can do the same for uh, EKV 2.6 or EKV 3. Great. Cool. So I think we, we it sounds like we have a beginning of a plan. So I think data measurements is the first step and then um, we can reconvene for another meeting to discuss those data and decide you know, how to use them for a model. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, Maybe I, I just have a, a question. I don't know if Boris is still uh, online. I, I was mm -hmm. wondering how can we get access to the PDK of Skywater because it would be uh, useful for me to, to run actually their PDK to reproduce what you got uh, uh, on your side, Boris, and mm -hmm. compare uh, then really uh, measurements and uh, and their PDK. Well, uh, I mean, what I found, so we have both the proprietary PDK here and the open source PDK. And you got and them directly that, from the foundry or from from Skywater? Yeah. So for the right, so for for the proprietary one, you have to sign an NDA. But okay. what I'm saying is, it's probably not necessary because I didn't find a difference between the proprietary models and the open source models. Okay. They're basically on top of each other. So yeah, I mean that was my first okay. suspicion, right? That maybe something got messed up when this was ported. But the commercial PDK is uh, the, the models also have the same problem, and this is actually why we approached Skywater. We said, "Hey, you may want to fix this um, because it's even okay. in your commercial PDK." So okay, can, I see. We can send an email to uh, Steve, maybe, and just uh, you know, if it's useful to Christian, that you know, I don't see why, why not, right? Um, yeah, it should be relatively straightforward. But but anyway, I mean, yeah, I, I think the open source models they are just fine. Especially, okay. I guess the the NMOS should be reasonably okay. the The problem is really with the PMOS model, and I don't know why uh, it's it's like that. Okay, so, so then then we'll try to to install the the open source uh, models. I think it would be also still useful to know like what is the state status of uh, noise uh, models, right? And like how the open source tools handle that versus the closed tools. So uh, doing those experiments would be very, uh, very useful. So I I looked a little bit at, at noise simulations. I mean, in particular that that gamma factor that Christian is looking at, and it looked reasonable to me. I think it's somewhere around 0.9 or so for this process at reasonable, so somewhat at the beginning of strong inversion. And I think from experience, it looks okay. So this Got is it. just to say it's not completely broken. Whether it's accurate, I don't know. Cool. All right. Um, 
Well, uh, one other thing, uh, Christian, um, I'm really, we're really interested in your notebooks, you know, uh, maybe sharing that as part of Chips Alliance or um, EPFL, doesn't matter, but, you know, getting those in Skywater 130 yeah. using open source tools would be very uh, insightful to the community. Yeah, as soon as I, uh, I mean, I can already put some of them, uh, but they're they're not specific to Skywater, but as soon as we extract the parameter, then it will be quite straightforward to uh, to customize them to to Skywater and then have them available on GitLab, for example. Awesome. But I think it's better we we do first the extraction and and then uh, yeah. update and customize those notebooks. Yep, that totally makes sense. So I think we are um, about uh, one p.m. here. So um, not sure if there's any other questions or uh, comments. If not, then we'll probably call the meeting. Any comments, Rob? No, no, it was a very informative talk. I really appreciate all, all the details uh, there, Christian, that you provide. Looks like some great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Christian and uh, Hanchi, and uh, hope to talk to you very soon. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bye coming. Bye. Appreciate bye you bye. Bye bye. Nice, bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Christian and everybody. Bye bye, Matthias. Bye bye.